in the 4th century AD, a religious dispute over a bishop sparked a massive revolt against the Roman Empire, led by an Arab warrior queen named Mavia, the rebels defeated multiple armies sent to subdue them, and visited widespread destruction throughout much of the Roman East. Eventually the Romans sued for peace and agreed to Mavia's terms. Below are 30 things about that revolt and other great uprisings from history. A religious dispute that seems minor today sufficed to spark a major revolt in the 4th century AD. In 375 AD Mavia a warrior queen, commenced her rule of the Tonicids, a confederation of Arab tribes whose range stretched from northern Arabia, through eastern Jordan to southern Syria, in the 4th century AD, they became the first Arabs to serve as Fodorati or allies of the Roman Empire. The relationship soured however over a religious dispute. The Tonicids were Orthodox Christians, but in 364 Emperor Valens and Arian ascended the throne. The doctrinal dispute between Arianism and Orthodox Christianity revolved around whether Jesus had always existed alongside God, and was thus his equal, or whether he was begotten by God and is thus his subordinate. To most people today, that might seem like a trifling difference, but it mattered to people at the time, it mattered enough for them to kill or get killed over. The Tonicids asked Valens to send them an Orthodox bishop, but he insisted on sending them an Arian one instead. So Queen Mabia who had recently ascended the throne, withdrew from her capital of Aleppo into the desert. There she began to gather support throughout the region, and to form alliances with other Arab tribes in preparation for a revolt. In the spring of 378, she launched a massive revolt against the Roman Empire. After widespread devastation, Queen Mavia finally got the bishop she wanted. When Queen Mavia's revolt erupted, it took the Roman East by storm. Rufinus of Aquileia, a 4th century monk, wrote that Mavia, the queen of the Saracens, began to rock the towns and cities on the borders of Palestine and Arabia with fierce attacks. She led her troops into the Roman province of Palestine until they reached the Mediterranean, then continued on as far as Egypt. She proved herself a formidable warrior. Rufinus added that she despoiled Rome's provinces, laid them to waste, and wore down the Roman army in frequent battles killed many, and put the rest to flight. Mavia's revolt was a kind of ancient world blitzkrieg, as she swept in with her forces, overran Roman territories, and left slaughters, massacres and devastation in her wake. Emperor Valens ran out of options and had to sue for peace. Mavia demanded an orthodox bishop, and insisted that a hermit monk named Moses, whom she admired be made that bishop. The Arian Valens agreed to the investiture, and Moses became the first Arab bishop of the Arabs. In return, the Tonicids resumed their alliance with Rome, and joined Valens in a war against the Goths, which ended in a Roman defeat at the Battle of Adrianople. The renewed alliance proved short-lived, however in the Tonicids rose up in another revolt in 383. This one was quickly put, and it marked the end of the alliance is unknown whether Mavia led the second revolt. What is known is that she lived until 425 and died in Conasir, a town east of Aleppo where an inscription notes her death that year. Female rulers gave the Romans plenty of grief in this part of the world. As seen above, Mavia's revolt gave the Roman authorities no end of trouble, however hers was not the first revolt by a female ruler in Rome's eastern provinces to cause the Romans plenty of grief. A century and a half earlier, an even bigger revolt against Rome's authority was led by Zenobia, a 3rd century AD Syrian queen. She challenged the authority of Rome and took charge of the short-lived empire of Palmyra from 267 to 272. In that span by a war, conquest, and diplomacy, Zenobia came to control and govern a sizable realm that encompassed most of the Roman Empire's eastern provinces. She was born Julia Aurelia Zenobia in Palmyra, a wealthy Syrian city that grew prosperous from its strategic location astride caravan trade routes. She was educated in Latin and Greek and was fluent in Aramaic and Egyptian. In her youth, she was put in charge of her family's flocks and crews of shepherds that hardened her physically for what was to come. The Queen of the Roman East Zenobia's duties in charge of her family's flocks left her accustomed to horseback riding and the outdoors life, because of that, she developed endurance and stamina, assets that came in handy later on in her life. In her teens Zenobia was married to Lucius Septimus Odinatius, Rome's client ruler of Palmyra. In the mid-200s AD, the Roman Empire was in the grip of a decades-long period of chaos and political instability that came to be known as the Crisis of the 3rd Century. 
the newly emergent Persian Sassanid Empire took advantage of that weakness to invade and conquer much of the Roman East. A loyal client Odinagus took up the cudgels on Rome's behest, fought off the Persians, and eventually recovered the lost Roman territories. For his services, the Pomerian ruler was made governor of most of the Roman East, and in 260 he crowned himself king. In 267, Odinagus and his eldest son by a previous wife were assassinated. So Zenobia stepped up and assumed power as regent on behalf of her underage son. She also crowned herself Queen of Palmyra and surrounded herself at court with intellectuals and philosophers. She was too independent, however, and a breach gradually grew between her and the Roman Empire. Zenobia's Revolt Tore the Roman World Apart Zenobia was a remarkable queen, noted for her culture, her intellect, her beauty and her toughness, it was recorded that she could march long distances on foot with her soldiers, could hunt as well as any man and could out-drink anybody. Unlike her deceased husband, she was not content to remain a Roman client and instead wanted to go her own way. So she rose up in revolt against Rome. In quick order, she conquered the Roman province of Egypt in 269, seized a significant part of Asia Minor from the Romans, and declared herself an independent ruler. By 270 she had conquered an empire that stretched from modern Turkey to Egypt, and from Mesopotamia to the deserts of Libya. Rome was forced to take note and in 270, a new emperor Aurelian, finally managed to restore a measure of order to the Western Roman Empire, he then turned his attention to the east and marched against Zenobia. He defeated her armies at Antioch and Emesa and besieged her in Palmyra. Zenobia tried to fight her way out and flee, but she was eventually captured. The Queen of Palmyra was supposed to march as a trophy in Aurelian's triumph in Rome, but she denied him that satisfaction by starving herself to death in 274 while en route to Rome. The start of the Common Era was a terrible time in ancient China. The Common Era did not start off well for China, in the stretch from the years 2 and 11 AD, the Yellow River underwent disastrous course changes that led to floods and famines, and widespread dislocation and hardship. As if that turmoil was not enough, in the middle of all that chaos, a vicious civil war erupted to further add to the misery of the Chinese. In AD Wang Mong, a government official, overthrew the early Han dynasty which had reigned over China for two centuries. In its stead he founded the short-lived Sin dynasty. The political turmoil, natural disasters, hardships and hunger took place against a backdrop of resentful peasantry, who had plenty of cause for resentment, their main grievance was a rise in debt slavery. When peasants borrowed to make ends meet, and they often were unable to make ends meet, and failed to repay the loans, they were sold as slaves to satisfy the debt. Another grievance was a steady consolidation of agricultural land, from the small plots typically farmed by small peasants that were seized and united into large tracts controlled by powerful magnates. Conditions were thus ripe for a peasant revolt. The Red Eyebrow Revolt That Roiled Ancient China the large-scale land consolidation of agricultural lands into large estates fell heavily upon China's peasants the former independent yeoman peasant owners, whose small plots were seized and amalgamated into large estates, were reduced to tenant farmers or serfs. They now had to till what had once been their own holdings on behalf of others, if they were lucky. Worse was the lot of those kicked off the land altogether, and were reduced to a life of itinerant wanderers. In response to the turmoil and dangers, and to protect the interests of the peasantry, the peasants formed a secret society. Its leader was a mystic who spoke through mediums, and ordered the organization of bands of armed Chinese peasants known as the Red Eyebrows, they took their name from the color of the eyebrows of their members, who painted their faces to look like demons. In 15 AD they initiated their first acts of armed resistance. The Red Eyebrows' popularity steadily grew, and by 17 AD their defiance had become a widespread peasant revolt. The rebellion had a collective leadership, in which a man named Fan Chong emerged as the most dominant figure the peasant rebels who made and erased emperors. Back in the imperial palace, Wang Mong who had overthrown the Han, and declared himself emperor of a new dynasty, turned out to be politically incompetent. In 19 AD his response to the Red Eyebrows peasant revolt and other uprisings across China was to raise taxes. That only fueled and supercharged the various rebellions, which soon consolidated into a massive insurrection. The disparate rebel bands came together, and united under the banner of the Red Eyebrows, and the leadership of Fan Chong. In 23 AD, the Red Eyebrows played a key role in the defeat, and overthrow of Wang Meng, and the downfall of his short-lived Sin dynasty.
a member of the Han royal family named Lu Xuan, sees the opportunity to re-establish the Han dynasty, and declare himself emperor, his rule did not sit well with the red eyebrows, however so they rose in revolt once again and overthrew him. In his place, they appointed a child Han descendant on the throne as a puppet emperor, while they ruled China in his name. However while the red eyebrows were militarily brilliant, they proved incompetent at governance, and their misrule soon led to widespread uprisings, their puppet emperor was overthrown, and replaced by another Han descendant Lu Xu, he forced the surrender of the red eyebrows and brought their movement to an end, then went on to found the later Han dynasty, which reigned for two centuries. The Sisters Who Became Their Country's National Heroines The Trung Sisters, Trung Nhi and Trung Trac, are probably the greatest national heroines of Vietnam, they led an independence movement and launched a revolt in 40 AD, against Chinese domination of their country. Vietnam had grown under Chinese domination for about a century by the time the Trung sisters were born. They managed to free their land from the Chinese yoke and established an independent Vietnamese state, which they ruled for three years. Trung Trac the older sister, was married to a Vietnamese nobleman, who resisted Chinese hegemony, and objected to the ham-handedness of a particularly oppressive Chinese governor. For his troubles, he was executed by the Chinese in order to cow other would-be rebels, it backfired. After her husband was executed, his widow rallied and organized other Vietnamese nobles to resist the Chinese. With the help of her younger sister Trung Nhi, Trung Trac launched a rebellion in the Red River Delta, near modern Hanoi. From there the revolt quickly spread up and down the long Vietnamese coast. After generations under oppressive Chinese rule, the Vietnamese were more than ready to rise up, and the uprising became wildly popular. A revolt led by armies of women. The Trung Sisters' revolt was unique among armed rebellions, in that their armies were made mostly of women, with those predominantly female forces. The rebel siblings seized numerous Chinese forts and citadels, and chased out or defeated their garrisons. Within a few months, Chinese authority in Vietnam was broken, the Chinese had been kicked out of the country, and Trung Trac was proclaimed queen. The sisters led Vietnamese armies against the Chinese, and although their forces were greatly outnumbered, the siblings managed to keep the invaders out of Vietnam for three years. Eventually however the Chinese concentrated an overwhelmingly massive force to recapture Vietnam, and in 43 AD the Trung sisters were finally defeated in battle, captured they were beheaded by the Chinese, who then went on to reassert their control over Vietnam. Although their independent state proved short-lived, the Trung sisters had nonetheless managed to plant the seeds of Vietnamese national identity. Conventional wisdom in Vietnam has it that there would be no Vietnamese nation today, had it not been for the Trung sisters, had they not rebelled against the Chinese, it is believed that Vietnam would have been wholly absorbed, and dissolved into China, and would today just be another Chinese province. Oppressed and brutalized Russian serfs mounted revolt after revolt. Until they were finally freed in the 19th century, Russia's downtrodden serfs rose up in revolt after revolt, only to get brutally beaten back into sullen submission each time, there were hundreds of relatively minor in size, but nonetheless quite violent uprisings, whose participants numbered in the hundreds or few thousands. However within a span of roughly a hundred years in the 17th and 18th, three uprisings caught fire, grew, and became major rebellions that rocked Russia to its core. The first of them occurred in 1670-1671, when runaway serfs, free peasants a decidedly relative term in Tsarist Russia and Cossacks, rose in revolt against Russia's aristocracy and government, rebellion erupted along the lower Don River on Tsardom's southwestern frontier, and spread out from there to engulf southern Russia. The revolt was led by a Cossack leader named Stepan Timoveyovich Razin, better known to history as Stenka Razin. Relatively little is known about Razin, other than that he was born into a lower-class Cossack family sometime around 1630. What he did within the span of a year, as the leader of a major revolt secured his place in his history. The River Pirate of the Volga The first mention of Stenka Razin in the historic record dates to 1652, when he sought permission to go on a pilgrimage to a monastery on the White Sea, he next appears in documents dated to 1661, when he was listed as a member of a diplomatic mission from the Don Cossacks to the Kalmyks, a Mongolian subgroup that lived on the steppe in Russia and modern Kyrgyzstan. His next appearance in the historic record is in 1667, when he was described as the head of a river pirate community. 
Rosin and his men preyed upon and exacted tribute from all vessels that plied the Volga River, and despoiled those that refused to pay up. The Cossacks from whom Rosin hailed were semi military democratic, self governing communities along Russia's southern and southwestern frontiers. They were not agriculturists but subsisted upon tolls on merchant shipping on the Don and Volga rivers as they traversed their lands. In exchange for their agreement to Russia's southern frontiers on behalf of the Tsar, the Russian authorities subsidized the Cossacks and tolerated their de facto independence. A future revolt leader's first step against the Russian authorities. The Cossacks routinely exacted tribute from vessels that plied the Volga River, a practice that was accepted by the authorities. However, it seems that Rosin went renegade in some fashion and exacted tolls in a manner inconsistent with the acceptable legalized piracy of the Cossacks that took place against the backdrop of a turbulent stretch of Russian history. In the 1650s and 1660s, wars, epidemics, and crop failures led to widespread misery and impoverishment throughout Russia. In the chaos, many serfs fled their oppressive masters to the Don River region, the heartland of the Cossacks. Russian authorities sought to forcibly retrieve the runaway serfs, but the Cossacks resisted, to bring them to heel and get them to change their minds, the Tsarist government cut off their subsidies and food supplies. In response the Cossacks took up arms. In 1667, Stenka Razin organized a Cossack regiment to resist the Russian embargo. In May of that year, he attacked a Russian caravan in which both the Russian Tsar and Patriarch of the Orthodox Church held stakes. It was the first step towards his eventual leadership of a major revolt. Dreams of a Cossack Republic Stenka Razin's attack on a caravan in which Russia's most powerful figures held stakes enraged the authorities, and he was declared an outlaw and criminal unconcerned Razin led his men to loot Persian settlements along the Caspian Sea. By the time he returned to the Don River region, he was a popular hero. He then organized about 7,000 peasants and runaway serfs and led them in a revolt on behalf of Russia's downtrodden. The uprising gained widespread popularity, and Razin's forces grew. In May of 1669, the peasant army captured Astrakhan and Tsaritsyn, modern Volgograd. After the city's populations opened their gates to Razin's men, the flame of rebellion spread, and by 1670 over 200,000 peasants and serfs throughout southern and southwestern Russia were up in arms. They formed into bands and attacked landowners and government officials. Razin sought to establish a Cossack Republic along the Volga River as a preliminary step to a march on Moscow. He declared that he aimed to seize the Russian capital in order to eliminate the nobles and officials who obstruct the common people. The Brutal Suppression of Russia's First Major Peasant Revolt Unfortunately for Stenka Razin and Russia's downtrodden serfs, their run of success was halted at the city of Simbrisk, which they attacked but failed to capture. After two vicious battles in its vicinity, Razin's forces were routed and nearly annihilated by vengeful government forces. So Razin fled back to the Don. Despite the defeat at Simbrisk, Razin's emissaries stirred further uprisings farther north. He proclaimed his intention to found a republic, in which the Cossacks' absolute equality would be extended to all throughout the whole of Russia, that found receptive ears among the peasantry and serfs. Soon armed peasants in search of freedom and deliverance from their yoke, were gathered in bands on the outskirts of Moscow, and around Nizhny Novgorod, about 250 miles to the east once the government gathered its strength, however the lightly armed serfs and peasants proved no match for the discipline, and firepower of professional soldiers. The uprisings were brutally put down, followed by a wave of violent repression, in which hundreds of thousands of peasants and serfs were massacred, about 100,000 were slaughtered in the Novgorod region alone. By 1671 the revolt was over, and in April of that year, Stenka Razin was captured and taken to Moscow. There he underwent a gruesome public execution in front of St. Basil's Cathedral, in which his limbs were chopped off, before he was finally beheaded. The Next Major Russian Serf Revolt the next major serf uprising was led by Kondraty Bulevin, a democratically elected Cossack leader. The Bulevin Rebellion, also known as the Astrakhan Revolt, was the second of the three major peasant revolts that rocked Russia in the 17th and 18th centuries. As with the Stenka Razin uprising, this rebellion was triggered by tensions between Moscow and the independent Cossacks. They arose in no small part because the central authorities tried to stem the tide of serfs who fled their oppression in Russia. The downtrodden serfs ran away from the estates to which they were bound, and sought freedom in the Cossack frontier lands. 
as with Razan's revolt a generation earlier, when the Tsarist authorities tried to recover the fugitives for their aristocratic masters, the Cossacks resisted, there was another twist in the run-up to Bulevin's rebellion, resistance to westernization and modernization. At the time Tsar Peter the Great was engaged in radical reforms to modernize Russia, and bring it closer to Western norms. That rubbed many in Russia the wrong way, and it increased the resentment against the Tsar and his government. Attempts to recover runaway serfs once again sparked a major Russian rebellion. Much of what Tsar Peter the Great did was seen as sacrilege by Russia's pious peasants and an affront to their Orthodox faith that piled atop the peasantry's pre existing grievances and the oppression and injustice under which they groaned led to widespread discontent. Accordingly, many of them voted with their feet and escaped to the Cossack lands where they could toil and practice their faith in freedom. That left the landlords with a labor shortage so they pressured the government to recapture the fugitives and restore them to their masters. In response, Peter the Great ordered a census in the Cossack settlements in 1707, the goal was to identify the runaway serfs, so they could be sent back to Russia, and the estates on whose lands they were obligated to toil. An expedition to carry out the Tsar's decree was seen by the Cossacks as a threat to their freedoms. On the night of October 8, 1707, Kondraty Belavin led a Cossack band that fell upon the Tsarist force and wiped it out. It was the first act in a widespread if inchoate, peasant revolt that aimed to march on Moscow. A popular revolt that devolved into chaos. The goal of the serfs and peasants in the Belavin rebellion was not to fight the Tsar, instead they wanted to free him from the evil counselors who many peasants mistakenly believed had kept him ignorant of their plight. Others of a more religious bent believed that the real Tsar was hidden away. As they saw it, the person who claimed to be Tsar Peter, and who sought to implement the radical westernizing reforms that offended their orthodox faith was actually the Antichrist. That old-timey version of QAnon-type logic was one of the many reasons why the rebels lost. Although their revolt gained widespread popularity, poor leadership and vision condemned it to failure. Among other things, Belavin failed to offer an alternative czar around whom the discontented could rally and unite. As a result, much of the armed resistance was frittered away in various eruptions, which the authorities could deal with piecemeal. Additionally, although Tsar Peter was engaged in a major war against Sweden at the time, the rebels failed to coordinate their actions with the Swedes, so the Tsar had enough time to amass a 32,000 man army to deal with the serfs. That force steadily stamped out the revolt, and eventually, as the rebellion collapsed beneath the hammer blows of bloody defeat after bloody defeat, a faction of Bolaven's followers turned against the rebel leader and assassinated him on July 7, 1708. That finally brought the revolt to a quick end. The Greatest Russian Peasant Revolt The Pugachev Rebellion, also known as the Peasants' War, was the third and greatest of Russia's major peasant uprisings that erupted between 1670 to 1775, the revolt was led by Emilian Pugachev, a former Russian army lieutenant, and it posed an existential threat to Tsardom. As with the other rebellions, it took place against a backdrop of deep resentment by the peasantry of Russia's exploitative government and aristocracy. The downtrodden serfs' hardships were made even worse by a war against the Ottoman Turks. In Russia's decidedly not progressive taxation system, the costs of the war fell heaviest not upon the richest, but upon the poorest, the already downtrodden and exploited peasantry westernization efforts also played a role. In the reign of Tsarina Catherine the Great, Russia's elites embraced Western culture, arts, technologies, fashions, and foods. The new Western luxuries and westernized standard of living were quite expensive however. To pay for them, Russia's landlords turned to their peasant serfs, increased their tax burdens and squeezed them dry. A fake Tsar who sparked a major rebellion the increased taxation of the peasantry led to protests, increased incidences of serfs who fled their landlords' lands and rebellions. Between 1762 to 1772, over 160 localized peasant uprisings were recorded throughout the Russian Empire. In 1773, the discontent erupted into a massive peasant revolt. It was sparked by word that Tsar Peter III, who had been assassinated in 1763, had not actually been killed. Instead he was said to have escaped death, and fled to hide amidst the Cossacks from Tsarina Catherine the Great. In this narrative, the Tsarina was depicted as an evil figure who sought to thwart Peter III, from his intent to emancipate Russia's peasants from serfdom. The self-proclaimed Tsar Peter III was actually Emilian Pugachev, a Cossack born in the same village, 
where former peasant revolt leader Stenka Razin had been born a century earlier, Bugachev was a Russian army lieutenant, who had fought in the Seven Years' War. He eventually deserted, and wandered throughout southern Russia among Orthodox religious fundamentalists known as Old Believers. With them Pugachev hatched a plan to pose as the deceased Peter III. In that guise, he soon attracted widespread popularity amongst Cossacks, peasants, and non-Russian populations resentful of official discrimination, and demands to convert to Orthodox Christianity.